I uh, now call the fourth speaker to continue the case for the proposition, uh, Matthew O'Toole, MLA. Thank you, uh, Matt, and thank you, uh, everyone, for um, for tonight's debate. It's been notably uh, uh, good humoured and respectful on all sides um, uh, throughout um, throughout the proceedings thus far. Hopefully, that will continue uh, through my contributions and afterwards. Um, there is uh, a strange contradiction at the heart of our debate about the Constitution in this part of the world, because in many ways the debate never stops, and indeed has never stopped since the partition of Ireland and the creation of the jurisdiction of Northern Ireland, or perhaps even earlier than that. But in reality, there has been barely any serious debate about the relative merits of a new constitutional arrangement versus those of the status quo. Because debate means engagement with ideas, it means weighing one's own arguments against those of others and attempting to convince those others, and indeed those without a preconceived view, that your arguments, and in this case, your vision, are substantively better. Only an optimist would claim that serious debate has happened on the substantive arguments around constitutional change in Ireland. Our politics in Northern Ireland is in large part about managing a unique society in which constitutional preference has been a continuation of communal or confessional identity. Add on to those identities the accumulated trauma and subsequent narrative construction from a three decade civil conflict, and you do not have the ideal ingredients for respectful or fruitful debate about optimal constitutional arrangements. So the time has come for those who believe in constitutional change to at least start the work of planning and developing arguments in favour of it. I will do some of that tonight in support of the motion. Uh, but in arguing for the proposition, it will be necessary to first address, and this is critical, the meaning or various meanings of the term United Ireland. Understood at its simplest, it means that there will be no sovereign border on the island of Ireland. It will mean uh, a new state, or at the very least, such an altered and, in my view, enhanced version of the Irish state as to be a new state in fundamental ways. It would not necessarily mean, in my view, the end of Northern Ireland, as is sometimes claimed, uh, because for a, wide -ranging, for a wide range of reasons, from history uh, to identity to simple logistical governance, it would be impossible to do so. Nor would it, or should it, mean an end to the cultural and familial intimacy that exists across the islands of Britain and Ireland. I returned to Northern Ireland just over a year ago. For most of the previous 20 years, I lived in Britain. Lots of my family and most of my closest friends still live there. My son was born there. He was born uh, in St Thomas's Hospital within sight of the Houses of Parliament. My relationship to Britain, like that of many people from this place, is complex, but also intimate and meaningful. But I don't believe that that uh, intimacy of people uh, and culture necessarily means that the best long-term way of governing this place is via Whitehall, or that a close and reconciled relationship between the people of these islands has to mean a border on the island of Ireland. As some of you may know, it was said at the beginning of the session, uh, I once worked at the heart of the British government as a civil servant. You may hear, by the way, the son I just referred to is yelling in a room downstairs. If you're wondering what that, it's not a heckler, thankfully. Um, as you may know, I uh, used to work at the heart of the British government as a civil servant. Uh, in the years to come, uh, and in the years to come, and this will take years, we can find a new and, in my view, more constructive relationship uh, for, for uh, framework for relationships across uh, these islands. That would mean an Ireland that is comfortable not just accommodating, but treasuring its Britishness as well as its Irishness. But lest I be accused of trading in generalities and vague themes, I want to come on to some of the more of the practical and meaningful reasons to believe that an Ireland without borders is a better way of organising ourselves. In doing so, I will inevitably draw the occasional negative contrast with our current arrangements. As I said, I hope those arguments aren't interpreted as being atavistic or anti-British or even anti-Northern Ireland, because I won't interpret parallel arguments made against a new Irish state at, uh, as an attack on Irishness or indeed the current Irish state. There have been many uh, already interesting and strong arguments made against the proposition, including from the previous speaker, but also from, from, from Jeff Dodgen and Grant Warren. First, uh, why, we are why are we are invited in this part of the world to constantly look backwards to our difficult past? What we are debating tonight is in fact the future. It is the century to come, not the century that has been. And as we meet that century, what are the dilemmas and challenges that will shape all our lives, whatever our identity? First, how we address a climate emergency that has now already probably changed this planet irreversibly. How do we maximise the benefits of technological advance while protecting human health, democracy and even basic dignity from its negative effects? 
how do we finally address the yawning inequalities between rich and poor, between old and young, that have been corroding the social contract in many countries for decades? Those of us who believe in constitutional change in Ireland will need to explain how our preferred change will help meet those challenges, and I believe we can. On climate change, neither part of the island has contributed as ambitiously as we should have to the transition away to the transition away from reliance on carbon. And in truth, any effective plan to reduce not just emissions, to protect and enhance biodiversity can only succeed if properly co coordinated across the small island. To give some specific examples, whether it's eliminating fossil fuels from an already integrated electricity market, making our farming less intensive, mass reforestation or recovering lost biodiversity, it makes very little sense for us not to tackle this existential challenge together. When it comes to economic development, it isn't enough to simply look at the subvention Northern Ireland receives from Whitehall and say, as others have said on this call, uh, on this meeting, fiscal transfer means we can't ever think about doing things differently. It's possible, uh, I would uh, submit to the House, that we should look at the scale of our fiscal transfer and ask why we aren't doing things differently. Because Northern Ireland, despite the subvention, remains close to the bottom of most economic league tables in these islands. There are, of course, bright spots, gleaming bright spots in our economy. They've been referred to, including by Grant Warren, our growing cyber hub, our genuinely world-leading creative industries. But it would be disingenuous not to acknowledge that we have chronic challenges that simply are not getting better. We remain underskilled, underinvested in infrastructure, and unable to keep or attract back many of the amazing young people who are educated here and then leave. We suffer from long-standing regional imbalances, not least in our second city. It would be disingenuous to acknowledge, in, in my view, to acknowledge that one of the not to acknowledge that one of the strongest push factors for many of those young people who leave is the sense of a society addicted to gazing inwards and backwards. Young people of all like all identities, all constitutional persuasions, and none can feel bogged down and sometimes dragged down by the weight of this place. That has a profound economic as well as societal impact. No doubt some of the young people on this call, some of the students, are themselves considering whether they can stay here after they graduate. To be clear, I want people to leave here, travel and see the world. That's a healthy thing. But I also want them to feel that this is a society they can come back to. What isn't healthy is the fact that Northern Ireland has created and seems intent on reinforcing several factors that only serve to push people away from this place with damaging economic, social and cultural consequences. We know that this isn't just about economic opportunity. It's also about feeling that the society you live in is responsive to change and that it can itself change. Leaving aside questions of the constitution and political identity, we know that some of the, on some of the biggest issues relating to new rights, for relating to rights for individual citizens, this jurisdiction has been slow to move. So much so that on the questions of equal marriage and reproductive rights, it took a campaign of shaming the UK government for action to be forced from Westminster via private members' legislation. Jeff Dudgeon mentioned this earlier on, but again, I would ask whether it's fine for us to simply accept that, only that the society can only advance itself through intervention from Westminster. And even now, with the UK Parliament having passed abortion access into law, abortion services in Northern Ireland have still not been properly commissioned. While I certainly don't want to rest this case on negative grounds, it would be remiss of me not to point out the very real ways in which our current constitutional setup has failed to deliver on rights that people in other parts of these islands take for granted. In making my case for unity, it is also worth being clear that none of this will be achievable overnight, nor should we be rushing into constitutional change without much more detailed planning and clear-headed appraisal of what the options look like. Nor, and this is critical, can an aspiration to constitutional change be an alibi for not making Northern Ireland work, uh, Northern Ireland and its institutions work in the here and now for everyone? I said at the beginning that I didn't want to focus on the past, but of course we can't pretend that the past doesn't exist, and we can't move forward without better processing the trauma of the past and indeed overcoming the myths of the past. Jeff Dudgeon spoke persuasively of those too. Those of us who believe in change will need to find a way of placing reconciliation and historical uh, reckoning at the core of our efforts. And that brings me back to the beginning of my remarks and indeed the, the concept at the heart of tonight's debate, a united Ireland. What do we mean by united and what do we mean by Ireland? At the end of his seminal history, Modern Ireland, Professor Roy Foster, writing in the late 1980s, a very dark time for this place, expressed a wish for a more relaxed and expansive definition of Irishness in Ireland. The motto of another country, the United States, is, of course, e pluribus unum, out of many, one. United can and must mean many and plural. Ireland can and must mean every identity and experience that makes up this island, including Britishness, Northern Irishness, and a new richness of 
color, language, and self-expression that goes beyond tired historical categories that have weighed us down. In closing, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, or Mr. Convener, I'd like to commend uh, tonight's proposition to the House on that hopefully hopeful and positive note.